Hi there, good morning. Uh, welcome, I'm here in my office today. Uh, now having um, an office at home with fully fledged internet means that uh, I can be in different locations, which is handy uh, because we have ongoing building works. And I know some people are wondering whether or not we are coming back to having Sunday services again. Uh, it won't be happening anytime soon because at the moment the whole building is being used for uh, all the renovations that are going on. So even if there is a will and a desire to come back, it's physically impossible to do so. So until the building work uh, begins to move or to change, uh, then we can start having conversations about how that looks and, and what it uh, means. But at the moment, uh, there is no immediate rush uh, possible for us to get back into the building to meet together. So we'll continue to do our online stuff, continue to meet in different ways, uh, but we will be encouraging people as things are easing to perhaps meet in homes or in uh, the garden as government guidelines continue to be updated. Well, today we begin our series on suffering. We're looking at four parts of suffering. And today I'm gonna to be uh, looking at this sort of question that often comes up about, well, you know, if God is good, then why is there evil and suffering in the world? Um, and just to help us think around that topic, I'm going to go to uh, a, a passage in 1 Peter and in 1 Peter 1 and verses 3 to 12, uh, it says this, and it's a, a bit of a mouthful, but we'll, we'll um, go through it. It says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are being shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a while, little while you may have suffered grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in the praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances of which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. When they spoke of the things that which have now been told to you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, even the angels long to look into these things. Lord, well, we'll give thanks for his word and let's just pray together before we open up uh, this whole topic around this passage together. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for just uh, this gift of, um, uh, Lord, the gospel and of yourself and of hope. And Father, we thank you that what people long for, we are in the full experience of now. We pray, Lord, that we may experience your love, that inexpressible joy as we go through this passage, as we uh, tackle a difficult subject. May we know that blessing uh, of your power at work in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, one of the uh, things in living in a pandemic, it inevitably creates questions about suffering and God. Uh, and you may have your own thoughts around that, questions of, of why and how and, and, and what does this all mean. But generally, there is a question that is raised around suffering, which becomes and is formed an, um, as an objection to the Christian faith. And it tends to go something like this. If God allows evil and suffering to continue because he could stop it but won't, then he might be all powerful, but he is not good. Or another one is if God allows evil and suffering to continue because he can't stop it, then he might be good, 
truly good, but he is not all powerful. Either of those statements often are part of an underlying assumption when people talk about suffering and in relationship to God's, who God is. But either way, the main objections are that the God of the Bible, if that's who he is, and this is what suffering, um, the result of suffering, then he, he, he couldn't exist. And so how do we engage with questions like that? How should we approach this whole question of uh, suffering and evil? And our Bible reading today that we're using helps us because it's a letter written to Christians who were undergoing immense persecution. People who were not just suffering, but facing ongoing suffering just of being Christians. Being persecuted by the Roman Empire, persecuted by those uh, around them just for living a different life, following a different way. And what is written helps us to understand how to have a good approach to evil and suffering in the world, how we should engage with this whole topic. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at one way in, in actually um, that identifies that a way that we shouldn't uh, think of this subject. This passage leads us onto a path in saying this is how you don't approach evil and suffering. And then it gives us two key points that we can lean into that is, is a more positive way of looking and framing and engaging with evil and suffering. And that's where we're going to go today. So when we are faced with this, you know, difficult situations, when we are faced with horrendous situations, what can often happen is in the face of, of, of such things that are an affront to us, we step away from God. Or in some cases, people give up belief in God altogether. And maybe there are times when you're in a conversation with a neighbor, maybe during lockdown, you know, someone might sit there and start asking, well, you know, if God is, is there, then how, do, how can all this COVID-19 be allowed to happen? And maybe in those moments you suddenly think, well, I need a toilet, and you never return to the conversation. When it comes to engaging with difficult situations and the nature of God, we distance ourselves in one way, shape or form. And that's quite a natural thing to do because we're wrestling with it ourselves. But in verses six to seven, it says this. Though now for a little while you may have suffered, suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These come so that you, so that the proven genuineness of your faith, which is of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by the fire. And what the writer is saying in this bit is that in facing times of suffering and of hardship, of, of big questions that we, we have to wrestle with, that the effect of that is that it's the strengthening and the proving of the value of faith, in, in particularly in following Jesus Christ. That there is a, a huge, enormous, uh, like gold, greater worth than gold, is, is having faith in Christ. And so if the implication is actually uh, hard times refine you, then the opposite is also true. That facing these times and abandoning your faith, stepping away because you know it, 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 you don't want to engage with the big questions, doesn't work. And the reason why it doesn't work is because the moment you step back and step out, you have no framework of understanding why there's evil and suffering in the world. You, you step away from. Um, it, it, trying to develop some form of, of means in how to handle what you're going through. Handle it in a way that is positive, that is helpful. So if you remove God from the picture of life, let's just journey with that for a second. How would that outwork itself? If you were to step back completely and you were just to remove and say, you know what, God doesn't exist. Well, how would you know if you remove God from the picture of life and of the world as a whole, how would you know if a law that comes out in the country is unjust? You know, the recent protests in our country uh, around race uh, and people fighting for injustice is born out of a Judeo-Christian worldview, that sense of equality that we are all created in the image of God. That's what was written in the Human Rights Charter in 1948. It came from a Christian worldview through the UN. But someone could easily come along and say, well, 
you know, we, we should just be fair to someone. That That's what makes sense. That's what's rational. You know, you do to others uh, what you would have them do to you. But think about that for a second, because one person's opinion on what is good for them doesn't mean necessarily that it's good for the other person. And so actually, even though we're trying to think through, through rationally and fairly, what makes sense to one person doesn't make sense to another. So in a sense, someone else could turn around and say, well, why should I listen to your opinion? Why should that be the one that I follow? But if, you, in fact, you were to push life further without God, how would you judge human history? If you pick up a naturalistic worldview that this world is all that there is, that the the, the molecules, the substance of it, that's it. If that's your world view, then this world on a naturalistic footing thrives on injustice and survival of the fittest. You only have to look at nature to see that at work. You know, and, and if you're going to hold that view, then you can sit there and say, well, people can be oppressed. Well, that's just life. And Cecil Rhodes came to that conclusion when after he read The Origins of Species, or as the full title suggests, the origin of species or the preservation of favoured races in the struggle of life by Charles Darwin. With no God, there is no ultimate good. There is no compulsion to be honest, just or to help the oppressed. You may have a feeling of compassion. You may have a sense that something is not right. You might rationalize and say, you know, what, human flourishing is best served by helping each other. But there is no compulsion. There is no sense of urgency or need for people to take up your ideas seriously. There is no law that you can legislate that will shape character to help fit those ideas, especially not in a Western society. And what this, what this means is that evil and suffering is not just an issue for those who uh, believe in God. In fact, it's a harder problem when you begin to contemplate it and begin to work it through for those who don't believe in God. In, so in stepping away from God um, it is not better when it comes to evil and suffering. In fact, it just creates even more questions, even more difficulties, even harder frameworks to work with. So the question is, what does help? What does help in this situation? Well, suffering here in the reading is likened to fire and a purifying process in the metalwork. It's what we just read. And perhaps Peter has in mind in Daniel 3 and the account of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. You know, the three friends were thrown into a fiery furnace for not worshipping an idol of King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. And the king throws them into the fire and he waits to watch and they sit there because they say we're refusing to bow down to anyone else but the lord our god and as he's watching them being thrown into the fire he sees another person in the flames and it says one like the son of man who's walking around in the furnace with them of course that brings to mind as well as daniel 3 when we think about going through the fire we think about Isaiah 43, verse 3, and it says this. It says, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by my name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. And when the flames will, and the flames will not set you ablaze. And God's promise is here three times is when, isn't it? When you go through these things, when these things happen, I will be with you. Not if, when these things happen, I will be with you. My presence will be there to uphold you. And in other words, what it, it, the writer is sort of saying is, is your inner world will not shatter. Your whole inner life will not crumble. You will not become hard and bitter. You will not be consumed, but instead refined through the process. And it is the cross of Christ that that um, at, at the cross of Christ that the promise becomes truly profound. It, it says this, it indicates this in our reading. If you go to verses 10 and 11, it says this concerning the salvation. The prophets who spoke of the grace that has come to you searched intently and with greatest care, trying to find out the time and the circumstances to which the Holy Spirit of Christ in them was 
predicted that uh, was pointing when he predicted the suffering of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. And these words, the sense that the prophets were looking for the Messiah, were looking ahead to the fulfillment of the ultimate promise in him, means that Isaiah's reading comes to life for us today. You might sit there and think, how so? Well, it's only in the Christian faith where the reality comes together that you have God take on human flesh and become vulnerable to the evil and suffering with us. It is only in the Christian faith that we come to the cross and to Jesus there dying for us, that you have a person, when you look at the cross, who experiences oppression and injustice. So for anyone who is looking around at the moment and sees a sense of injustice, knowing that we've been oppressed, you can look at the cross of Christ and there is God in human form, identifying with what it's like, experiencing that sense of shame, experiencing that sense of being oppressed by uh, governments and things uh, and regimes and structures and systems. If you're going through grief, you look at the cross of Christ and there you see Jesus in his humanity, dying and being separated, going through that agony, the father going through the agony, the spirit trying to sustain in that moment as uh, the Godhead becomes, uh, goes through that, that deep sense of grief. When we're at a loss and we're asking God, why? Why on earth is this happening? Why is this all going on? We see the words of Jesus on the cross, crying out, quoting Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Crying out. And there is more that we can mention about Jesus's journey to the cross that relates to evil and suffering. But the greatest thing is the thing that we don't see. And that's Jesus taking on the weight of our sin. All of our wrongdoing that becomes a barrier to God's goodness is placed upon Jesus. Every wicked thought, every evil action is pressed upon him so that we could be justified. He faced all the injustices so that we could be made just in the eyes of God, so that we could be in the presence of God, so that we could be refined in the presence of God with no barrier. So if you were to take that question of evil and suffering to the cross today, you won't receive a direct answer to a very complex and fluid question. However, what the cross does tell us is that in the midst of evil and suffering, it can't be that God doesn't love us. It can't be that God is punishing us because Jesus took that weight of punishment for us. It can't be that God doesn't care because he's there in amongst with us. He's opening, he's doing uh, the, the most amazing act of goodness and grace to give us himself to make sure there's nothing in the way in terms of being able to encounter his presence on the cross god opens the door so that he can be present in our hearts he by his holy spirit can come in our, the core of our being to live each moment each day as we walk through the fire god is there walking with us So you see some responses at the cross, but this passage also gives us not just a sense of being able to look to Jesus at the cross, but also a way of looking forward to that helps us to answer this question of evil and suffering, to engage with it. Look at verses three to five in your Bibles in this chapter. It says, praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy has given us a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed at the last time. In other words, what he's saying is we have a living hope. And if you've got a Bible, underline it, circle it, mark it. We have a living hope. And a living hope is described as an inheritance. 
In other words, it is something of an immense value, something that he describes here as being securely kept in heaven. But one writer says that as this living hope gives an idea of being spiritual, in another sense, it's not. The resurrection of Jesus is the demonstration, is the first fruits of the hope that we receive. The resurrection tells us that in our final place, when everything is said and done, what awaits us is a tangible reality. A new heaven and a new, uh, new earth is promised. Something not just uh, spiritual and afar, but something that as earth and heaven come together, everything is changed and transformed. It's real. That's why Jesus ate fish in his resurrected body to demonstrate the realness of what comes. And Paul in uh, the very densely packed 1 Corinthians 15, answering questions about what does heaven look like? What will our bodies look like? What will this whole sense of transformation look like? Says in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 54, it says this, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. That means we won't remain just in a dead state. But we will all be changed in a flash, in a twinkling of an eye. As the last trumpet is sounded, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable. And we will be changed. From the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable. In other words, what is mortal becomes immortal. He says that, he says, and the mortal with immortality. And he says, when the perishable, in other words, what we are now, has been clothed with the imperishable, mortality with immortality. Then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Someone wisely and very rightly said, resurrection isn't compensation for this life. It is the restoration of this life. Resurrection isn't compensation for this life. It is the restoration of this life. We are taken up, purified, unspoiled, and become incorruptible. And it's because we have this living hope, that sense of that reality, that sense of what God has set in our hearts through the gift of the Holy Spirit that is kept, but is also so real that is coming. But it gives us hope in amongst our suffering. It steers us forward that there is something greater. In other words, we are not locked into an endless cycle of rebirth and karma. No, we move forward to a glorious, tangible future when everything we will see again, we can touch and we can know. And Paul emphasizes even more the point in the end of that chapter. He just says, our labor, everything that we go through for suffering now is not in vain. Everything that we work towards, everything that is good and right is not in vain. What is fashioned through our hardship, he says, will be taken up in the next stage. It is through this living hope through engaging and holding on to God and the cross that we begin to make perfect sense of these verses that he writes in 8 and 9. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And though, even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith. You are receiving the end result of your faith now, the salvation of your soul. Our joy this morning comes from knowing and walking with God in his presence. God wanted us to have this in our suffering. That as we face evil, as we face the things around us, that we hold on. That sense that he is walking with us in the fire. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this enormous gift that reaches us both now and to what's to come. We thank you that it was in your heart to bless us. It was in your heart to, Lord, be so close with us. And for whatever trials and things that we're facing now, may we have that increased awareness of your presence. Holy Spirit, would you come and bless us and enlarge our hearts, we pray. Would you give us that deep sense of love that we have that comes just, Lord, in being in relationship with you, knowing how much you've gone through for us because you want to be with us. May we know your sustaining power. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Well, God bless you for the rest of your day, uh, wherever you are, um, or even if uh, you're watching us at the end of the day, may the Lord go with you uh, in a very real and powerful way. Amen. <laughs>